Well, thank you for joining me once again for the Well-Read Christian Podcast. I uh, am very thankful for the fact that you're listening right now, whoever you are and wherever you are and whenever you're listening. Um, But before I get started, as always, I want to encourage you to go to wellreadchristian.com, find our social media sites, and like them, please. If you're on Twitter, if you're on Facebook, there's no reason for you to not be a fan. Throw me a like. It's really helpful for uh, Facebook and YouTube and and Twitter and and all those places. They they look at that. They look at that and they promote material based on how many likes and that it gets. So please do that. Okay, what else? Leave a review. Look at our blog. That kind of stuff. Okay, that's it. So, in the introduction episode uh, of War and Peace, back you know, episode one, actually the first episode ever, I explained that Tolstoy sees all of history as a cohesive and even deterministic whole, since one event or group of events leads to other events, almost necessarily. And Tolstoy discovers this when he's doing research on the return of exiled revolutionaries. He wants to explain where these revolutionaries came from, and who they are. And so it goes back to the original revolution, which really has its roots in the Russian war with Napoleon in 1812, which of course began in 1805. And so for Tolstoy, Napoleon's eastern expansion necessarily had to lead to the destruction of Moscow because of facts and conditions established beforehand. But in the same way, once Moscow was destroyed, this set off a chain of events that necessarily led to the Decemberist Revolution. And, by the way, this Decemberist Revolution set off a spring of repeated revolution attempts, none of which were really successful, until Vladimir Lenin's revolution in 1917. So Tolstoy is not just interested in the deterministic side of reality, though, and this is what makes him so fascinating. Most thinkers want to emphasize the freedom of human beings to craft their own destinies, or the determining factors of our environment, or our chemical makeup, and our genes, and our and stimuli, and that kind of thing. But Tolstoy recognizes the validity of both, and he s- is simply flabbergasted. I mean, how can we live in a universe where physics dominates everything, and one event necessarily leads to the next event, both in history and even in our own personal lives, while simultaneously living in a universe where every individual action you and I perform seems completely free. Listen to this quote. A man killing another, Napoleon giving the order to cross the Neiman, you and I applying for a job, raising and lowering our arm, are all unquestionably convinced that each of our acts is based on reasonable causes and our own free will, and that it is dependent on us to act that way and not otherwise, and that conviction is so inherent and dear to each of us that, despite the argument of history and the statistics of crime which convince us of the involuntariness of other people's actions, we extend the consciousness of our freedom to all our acts. The contradiction seems insoluble. In committing an act, I am convinced that I am committing it in according to my own good pleasure. Examining this act in terms of its being part of the common life of mankind in its historical significance, I'm convinced that this act was predetermined and inevitable. Where does the mistake lie? Psychological observations of man's ability to make an instantaneous retrospective adjustment of a whole series of allegedly free conjectures to an accomplished fact confirm the assumption that man's consciousness of freedom in the committing of acts of a certain sort is mistaken. But those same psychological observations prove that there are acts of another sort in which the consciousness of freedom is not retrospective, but instantaneous and unquestionable. Whatever the materialists may say, I can unquestionably commit an act or refrain from it, insofar as that action concerns me alone. By my will alone, I have unquestionably just raised and lowered my arm. I can presently stop writing. You can presently stop reading. Unquestionably, by my will alone and outside any obstacles, I can mentally transport myself right now to America or to any mathematical problem. Testing my freedom, I can raise and forcefully lower my arm in the air. I have just done so. But there is a child standing beside me. I raise my arm over him and want to lower it with the same force upon the child. I cannot do that. A dog attacks the child. I cannot help raising my arm against the dog. I stand in the ranks and cannot help follow the movements of the regiment. In battle, I cannot help attacking with my regiment and fleeing when everyone around me flees. 
when I am standing in court as defender of an accused man, I cannot help speaking or knowing what I am going to say. I cannot help blinking when a blow is aimed at my eye. End quote. So what he's saying here is that we, we commit certain acts that seem motivated by nothing other than free will, while we also commit other acts that seem predictable and somehow determined. We can raise and lower our arms or count to ten in our heads. Aha, see, I'm free. But would you ever just randomly raise or lower your arm or count to ten in your head if you weren't trying to prove a point? Maybe you were always determined to do it because your natural psychology mixed with the external stimuli of me challenging your free will caused you to try and prove me wrong. But in doing so, you might have still proved me right. Furthermore, human beings do actions instinctively all the time which don't seem to consult your free will. If you're driving and you rear-end the person in front of you, a curse word might be thrown out of your mouth before you even realize what's going on. If you see a dog lunge after your child, there isn't a force in the world that will prevent your arms from grabbing that dog. Furthermore, consider all the things in your life that aren't controlled by you. You aren't in control of who you fall in love with or what interests you. Now that's interesting. You aren't in control of what interests you. Why are you interested in the things that you're interested in? It's almost as if interest just reaches out and captures you and well now you're interested why do you have the hobbies that you have why are some things fun and other things boring you don't know have you ever tried to make a game out of doing the dishes I mean it might help but at the end of the day it's still a chore right why can't you decide who you admire you don't choose what foods you like or don't like you don't choose the thoughts that spontaneously occur in your head you have absolutely no control over the thoughts that randomly occurred to you. You can't control your moods, your cravings, the things that make you angry, you're happy, none of it. Tolstoy recognizes that there are these two laws of the universe which are polar opposite, and he can't figure out how to reconcile them. One law is that everything is determined. The universe consists of matter and motion, and in some sense, Everything else is dominoes. The other law of the universe, however, is that human beings are essentially free, and every choice we make is a striving for more freedom. I mean, think about it. Every choice we make is a choice we make to try to be more free. We eat to be free of hunger. We work to be free of poverty. We strive for health so we don't have to be sick. Fame and obscurity, power, submission, strength and weakness, education and ignorance, work and idleness, virtue and vice, all of it is a battle between freedom and slavery to something that we don't want. And our whole lives are oriented towards trying to be free. So how can we understand life if we're determined by forces completely outside of our control? People don't like to feel like they're just programmed robots going through their day-to-day -day lives. And so for Tolstoy, the question of free will and determinism is the essential question of all of human life. What Tolstoy is saying is this, hey, uh, if someone has a bad childhood and grows up on the streets, is it really just to punish them? I mean, they can't choose how they grow up. And Tolstoy says, <laughs> I don't know, I mean, ask a philosopher, I guess. Hey, um, if God already knows who I'm going to marry, is it really possible that I marry the wrong person? <laughs> and again, Tolstoy goes, ask a priest. I'm going to be a brave soldier on the front lines. And Tolstoy goes, yeah, okay, man. We'll, we'll see how you feel when you're out of ammo and everyone around you starts running away. And so it's almost like we're 100% free and we're 100% determined. And we have no idea how those realities interact. And so Tolstoy's entire point in writing War and Peace is to get you to see how true that is. And many critics have read War and Peace and they cited these short philosophical essays which are sprinkled in as blemishes on the work. But Tolstoy himself said that this is the unifying theme. He goes, this is why I wrote, because I want you to see how this reality interacts with your everyday life. Because this idea that we are totally free, but also totally determined, and we have no idea how that works, 
It matters. You see it every day. But it can't really be explained to you, and perhaps you're not even understanding really what I mean right now. You have to see it. And how can someone show you? Well, how about a story? So if you're ever tempted to go, yeah, yeah, this is kind of abstract. I'd rather go back to something else. Let's go back to romance or a battlefield or the meaning of life or something. Well, wait, you're missing it. The indescribable force which drives history and human motivation is right here. It's in every battle, every romance, every conversation, every character's inner thoughts, every decision they ever make. Let me try to give you some examples. Maybe it'll make more sense. The first example I'd like to use is Prince Andrei Bolkonsky's father. He's called Old Count Bolkonsky in the book. And the Old Count is a harsh man. And when Andrei goes off to war, Andrei leaves his pregnant wife with his sister. And uh, Lise, the little princess, dies in childbearing. And from that point on, Prince Andrei's sister, Marie, lives with the Old Count alone. And these two have an interesting relationship. Andre's father loves Marie, but he has a short temper and often says very harsh and cruel things. And Marie continually submits herself to him as he teaches her math and science, and they read books together and, and all sorts of things. Marie is very bright and a well-educated person, thanks to her father, but that doesn't stop him from having a tendency to berate Marie. And there's this one scene in particular where the French forces are getting very close to Bald Hills Manor, where they live, and so the old prince orders his daughter to evacuate to Moscow, but he himself will stay with the militia. Well, Marie, for the first time in her life, allows herself to disobey her father in an attempt to save his life. Well, of course, this earns a long tirade of accusations that it was her fault that he and André don't get along, and she's made it her goal to ruin his life, and all these sorts of things that are nonsense. And he drives her out of his study, and says he doesn't care whether she goes or not, and slams the door. However, Marie knew that in her heart of hearts, as the days passed on, that her father was glad that she didn't leave, and if he really wanted her gone, he would have ordered that she be taken by force. And so you may ask, if the old Count really wanted Marie to stay, why did he have to yell at her and demand that she leave and all the rest? Why can't he just say what he wants and mean what he says and say what he means? And wouldn't that be great? Wouldn't it be great if we could all just say what we mean and mean what we say and say it exactly how we want to say it with exactly the tone that we want? But the old prince can't do that. He's incapable of communicating how he feels, whether it be from old age or illness or temperament or whatever. That's just the way that he is. He's angry and he's very bad at telling his children that he loves them. He's not free to communicate rationally. This is one of his personal weaknesses, and we all have them. We're subject to the darker sides of ourselves that we're not proud of, and, and, and we're ashamed of it. And, and if we're virtuous people, then we're working on them. But that doesn't mean that they don't have a legitimate sense of control over our lives. Marie knows this about her father, and, and she loves him anyway. And the man will soon enough have a stroke, and and in his last moments will say more in just a few words than he's ever been able to say in a lifetime. And still, you might say, well, that guy is just a jerk. I mean, he should get his act together. And you wouldn't be wrong. But there are a lot of jerks who should just get their acts together, and they're still worth loving. Fathers, you know, spouses, brothers. And, and I'm not excusing the behavior by any means. But what I am saying is that if you understood the ways in which old Count Balkonsky is trapped inside of his temperament and brain chemistry and 60 years of bad decisions and wrong behavior, you'd feel sympathy and, and love rather than indignation. Okay, another example of this force that moves nations can be seen right here in a very great example at the very beginning of the novel when Pierre marries his wife. Uh, you, you're already aware of this if you've listened to the podcast thus far. What young man who just inherited millions of dollars and is in a new social situation in that culture and, and with the background and everyone around you is saying that this is a good idea and your heart bounces every time she walks into the room and you're too young and stupid and naive to think any different. I say 99 out of 100 people make the same mistake Pierre does. 
if they are in the same position. I mean, I'll allow one out of a hundred because maybe someone is too stupid or stubborn to listen to the people around them or, or maybe even wise. But the point is, is that there's, if, if there's intense pressure from everyone around you to marry this person and you genuinely like the person, but there's just this little thing in your conscience that says, oh, maybe, maybe you shouldn't, I don't know. I say 99 out of 100 people give in to that. I mean, we're all subject to the influences of the people around us. You know, whenever we make any decisions, we're always thinking, oh, well, well what's this person going to think? What's my family going to think? What's my, what are my friends going to think? What are they going to say? And it guides our behavior. And we're not in control of that directly, directly. So for Pierre, it's, it's not like he made that decision to marry this person in a vacuum. A thousand little choices that he didn't even realize he was making led to one thing and the next thing and the next thing you know, you're, you're on your honeymoon. And by the way, that's actually a very helpful thing to know about reality. Your friend group is probably going to determine the kind of person that you end up in a relationship with. However long you are in a relationship with that person, the longer it goes, the more likely that there's going to come a day where you can't even imagine your life without them. And, and maybe you don't even like them that much anymore, but you've been with them for five, six, seven, ten years. So, I mean, what are you going to do? Break up? So the point that I'm making here, and, and I think that the point that Tolstoy is ultimately making in, in, in a grander scheme is that decisions that you think that are made in a moment are actually made a thousand times over in little decisions. The people you spend your time with are going to influence a big decision like who you're going to marry. And this is intuitively known to us. I mean, think about it. We know with our own relationships, say, say you're married. Well, how did that happen? Let me ask you this. How did it happen that you married the person that you married? I mean, was it an accident? Did you, did you make the decision in a vacuum where you like transported into another universe where you had like two buttons of like this person or that person? No. You met them because they were spending time with other people who you knew and, and, one thing led to another, and next thing you know, you, you kind of like each other, and, and, you know, lots of little decisions go by, little dates, little interactions, little conversations, and then the years go on, and then the next thing you know, you're married. And so it's, th that's, a very good, that's a very good thing to know. So if you want to know who you're going to marry, or if you want to be conscious about who you're going to marry, don't think about it like, oh, well, that's just a decision I'm going to wake up one morning and make. Like, no, no, no. <laughs> that's a decision that you make with little tiny decisions throughout every single day of your, really your entire life. And I'm using Pierre as an example of this because, well, number one, he didn't control his friend group. He hasn't decided the kind of person that he wants to be. He's young. He's full of potential. But is also naive and, and not very bright. He hasn't thought about what he wants his life to look like. And, but at the same time, how can you blame him? What do you expect from him? What's his environment been like? Has anyone ever told him that he can do these things? And so this is the point that I'm trying to illustrate. In one sense, he's perfectly free and responsible. In another sense, he's bound by his environment and the choices that he's already made. And, and the fact that everyone's pressuring him to do something and he ends up doing it even if maybe somewhere in the dark recesses of his mind, he thinks that it might be a bad idea. Okay, so here's another example. This one is, this is great because it's the exact opposite. So when Pierre is alone in Moscow while the French are occupying it, he's sneaking around for food and shelter and he's hiding in basements and attics and, and he begins to get this crazy idea that he wants to assassinate Napoleon. He's angry at the French. He's angry at the Russians for not fighting the French better. He's angry at his wife for her selfishness and basically separating from him and only marrying him for his money. He doesn't have any real friends. He realizes that nobody really cares about him and everyone only likes him for his money. And every ounce of optimism is being drained every day until he finally decides that he's going to do the one thing that's good before he dies. He's going to make a mark on history and he's going to kill Napoleon. And he spends weeks brooding on this. He has dreams about it. And 
so he, he gets together the the weapons that he's going to use. I think he has a pistol, and then he uses a knife as a backup weapon, and he's he's trying to spot out where Napoleon is actually in the city, and, and so he's he's listening and he's spying, and and he has decided if there is one thing that Pierre Bezukhov is going to do with his life, it is kill Napoleon. So this is the closest thing that we could ever get to making a decision in a vacuum, like we were talking about before. Like, uh, two buttons, like, he chooses this. This is what he's going to do. He's made up his mind. One day, he gets captured by a French squad, and he becomes a prisoner of war. Now there's no chain link fences or anything. He just ends up having to sit around the same campfire and they keep an eye on him. And maybe at night they they put him in one particular room and lock it with a few other people. But what ends up being the reality is that he just kind of becomes one of the people. He becomes one of the guys. They're all telling jokes by the fire. They share the same looted bread and wine. They end up sharing experiences that they've had in their lives. And they're all laughing and telling about their families back home and After a few days, this touch of human interaction completely takes the wind out of Pierre's sails. He still wants to assassinate Napoleon. He remembers his conviction and his decision to do it. But he realizes, deep down, it's it's not going to happen. There's no way that you're doing this. And so later that night, they're all back around the same campfire telling jokes and laughing and talking about their family's back home and and he just says yeah that's that's not going to happen i mean the resolve is still there the decision's been made but it's not you're not going to do it in the critical moment you're not going to pull the gun out you're not going to pull the trigger and maybe you can relate to this not deciding that you're going to assassinate uh the emperor of france of course but you can relate to thinking about something for an hour for two hours Maybe you're laying in bed at night and you're thinking about something and you're like, no, I'm going to do that. I'm going to confront that person. I'm going to say this thing. I'm going to finally clean my room. I'm going to, whatever it is that you've decided, that's it. I'm doing it. I'm, I'm tired of this. And then maybe you fall asleep and the next morning you wake up and yeah, that's not going to happen. So this, the reason I'm telling you this is because it, it plays right into this theme of how Look, you think you're in control. And in some sense, you are in control. But in another sense, you're dominated by forces beyond your control. And this affects us in our everyday life. Okay, one last example. This is one of my favorite scenes from the book. Okay, so Pierre is a prisoner of war. And he's living with these Frenchmen for a few weeks in Moscow. And they've gone to the point where he is friends with all of the soldiers. They all know each other by name. They share bread and wine. They've told each other all about their lives and their upbringings and and that kind of stuff. I think I've said it like five times, so I'll go ahead and move on. Then one day, Pierre wakes up, and it's all gray and cloudy. There's a stir outside, and he looks out a window, and, and everybody's frantic. The French are packing up, and they're trying to leave Moscow. Napoleon has ordered that the entire army is going all the way back to France. Everybody's frantically packing and and trying to loot their last spoils. The French captain has jostled, jostled, that's a word, right? The French captain has jostled all the prisoners, and now they're marching west. All morning, Pierre has tried to whisper to someone and ask what's going on. But suddenly, everyone seems so stern and hostile. Like, what's the big deal? Just last night, we were all having a good belly laugh together. But now, everyone has frowns and scowls. It's as if everyone woke up grumpy and angry and disheveled. After a few hours of marching, there's a halt order, and everybody stops and looks around and is wondering why. And suddenly, it becomes clear that the French have decided that they could march faster if they kill some prisoners. And so the orders are given. Line up. They all line up. They, there's a firing squad all ready to go. And one by one, prisoners are sent up to the wall and are killed. And there's such a, this is such a powerful scene because it showcases Tolstoy's mastery at writing. He captures what this moment is like perfectly. Nobody wants to do this. The captain who ordered the executions can't even watch. 
the soldiers who are actually shooting are visibly shaking and can barely shoot straight. The prisoners, they, they can't help but go up to the execution line when they're shouted at to do so. I mean, what, what else are they going to do? They're in shackles and, and all the rest. I think there are a few people who do try to escape, but then someone just shoots them in the back. So prisoner after prisoner is mercilessly executed. They walk up and fire, bang. They fall over dead, and, and everyone in line starts to panic and look around, and, and they're, they're wetting themselves, but, well, there goes the next guy, and fire, bang. And it's just this haunting moment as Pierre realizes, I'm going to die right here. I'm going to be killed by the people who I was just talking to last night, but now they won't even look me in the eye. I mean, what in the world is going on? And suddenly, miraculously, preposterously, the captain orders that the men stop, and he, he's seen enough. And, and so they, uh, you know, they, they get back in a marching formation, and they keep marching, leaving the bodies behind. And Pierre's heart just melts and drains through his feet. What in the world was that? What just happened? The captain didn't even want to order it. But for some reason, whether it was pride or a sense of necessity or maybe because he thought they could march faster or it could, or maybe it's just the overcast weather that, that puts any, everybody in, uh, in a susceptibly bad mood, he decided to order the killing. And then as soon as he ordered it, it's almost like, oh, why did I do that? And every single soldier is st stumbling around and trembling and fearful, but, but they're all doing it. Everyone is playing their part. And they killed the men and the women who they were just dining with the night before, at least many of them. And then for some arbitrary reason, the captain ordered it to stop. And then they just keep marching. Well, well, well why did he order it to stop? Weak stomach? Boredom? Anxiety? Guilt? And, and why did he stop them now and not, oh, you know, three prisoners ago? And after he's decided that he's going to watch prisoners be killed, why not just kill all of them? So, Pierre sees the arbitrariness with which life sometimes guides and directs even the most cruel and, un and, and unnecessary actions. And I think that the idea that is communicated just by the environment, and, and I would love if someone else would read the scene and uh, tell me what they think, it's almost like the weather had decided today is going to be a gloomy day of dark things. And Napoleon orders that everyone goes back to France, which makes everyone go, uh-oh, why are we going home? I mean, we won, didn't we? Nope. Retreat order all the way back home. Oh, wow, that's a long haul. Okay, everyone needs to get up right now. Hey, you, you're not going fast enough. Go, go, go. Suddenly everyone's in a bad mood. Everyone's just trudging their feet. Captains are yelling at one another. and Sergeants are getting their men into shape. And there's an order that anyone who's caught looting is going to be shot on sight and the prisoners are suddenly no longer friends, but it's like they're prisoners. And then all of a sudden, hey, wait, wh what are we doing? Hey, we need to kill these prisoners. Bang, bang. You know what? We, we, we don't have time for this. Come on, let's go, let's go. What, what, what is going on? And I think maybe this is another example of something that maybe we could relate to. Of, again, Maybe we can't relate to shooting prisoners or having our fellow prisoners shot in front of us. We're probably not going to relate to that. But we might be able to relate to just, there are some days where it's like, what, what is going on right now? What is going on today? What, why are we all off on the wrong foot? Why can't we communicate effectively? Why is everybody angry with one another and irritated and, and bitter and stepping on each other's toes? What, what is going on? Like, no one wants that, but that's just what's happening. I think that's another example of this ongoing, swarm-like life of mankind that pushes and pulls and tears sometimes, but that no one is really in control of. It, it has a life of its own. And by the way, this idea that even the men in charge don't really have any power, this runs through the whole work too. This could have easily been the focus of the entire podcast. There's this battle called the Battle of Borodino where Tolstoy makes the point 
that, look, neither Napoleon nor Kutuzov wanted to fight, and yet it happened. As a matter of fact, l- let me read you this quote. Quote, In offering and accepting battle at Borodino, Kutuzov and Napoleon acted involuntarily and senselessly, and only later did historians furnish the already accomplished facts with ingenious arguments for the foresight and genius of the commanders, who, of all of the involuntary instruments of world events, were the most enslaved and involuntary agents. The ancients left us examples of heroic poems in which heroes constitute the entire interest of history, and we still cannot get used to the fact that, for our human time, history of this sort has no meaning. End quote. Tolstoy says, yeah, historians will say that the Russians baited Napoleon into a weak position and then set up fortifications at Borodino and then they sprung a surprise trap. You want to know what really happened? The Russians were scared out of their minds and were retreating for days, fumbling around. They passed up way better spots than Borodino. But they didn't want to fight. They were anxious and terrified and pathetic and... And finally, as they passed up Borodino and and set up camp, there might have been a sense among the troops that they preferred a battle over the constant running. But here comes the story again. Then the Russians set up a forward outpost, which Napoleon captured, giving him a false sense of assurance. And so he attacked, and the fortified Russians had sprung their trap and defeated Napoleon. Again, Tolstoy says, yeah, yeah, forward outpost. That was just the slowest marching soldiers who fell behind, so of course they were killed. And if the Russians wanted a forward outpost to keep an eye on the enemy, they would have just sent one or two squadrons of hussars. They wouldn't have had a whole battalion fall behind. And by the way, they didn't even set up the barricades until the day before, realizing, "Uh uh-oh, Napoleon is right here. So, no, they weren't prepared for it. They didn't spring this genius trap. And Napoleon also didn't really feel like doing that battle. They were moving forward, and then it was like, oh, here are the Russians. I I guess, well, we're going to fight them. And so the battle was a battle where neither side wanted to fight. And that's really a tale of all war. But there they are fighting and mass carnage and then here come the historians like oh this was just this brilliant stroke of insight where these commanders are playing this and he goes nah 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 that's not how it happens time chance luck fate that's how life works not these greek heroes napoleon and kutuzov in an epic battle of the wits three-dimensional chess that sort of a thing no 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 that's how historians tell it but the truth is is that what really happened is that thousands of scared and pitiful soldiers drugged their boots and tried to do their jobs, and then two coincidences and an accident later, there was a battle. And who wins the battle, by the way? Whichever side fights harder. Well, which side fights harder? Whatever side has more men who are putting in more courage and effort. Well, why does any one individual man put in more courage and effort? Well, many reasons that are incalculable. Maybe he ate a good breakfast, or was thinking about his family that morning, or or maybe those around him are fighting harder, and so it gives him courage. Maybe he trusts his commander and has sincere faith that we'll win. So, why does one side fight and win, and another side fight and lose? The reasons are small and incalculable, and beyond anybody's control. And these small and incalculable factors are decided by God, not by men. As it is written, the hearts of kings are in the hands of God. And when Tolstoy says that, he, he's quoting Proverbs 21.1, which says, of course, the king's heart is a stream of water in the hand of the Lord. He turns it wherever he will. And, and there's a long tradition in Judeo-Christian thought which says that God is in control of history. He controls the will of kings. He determines battles. And he determines all of our lives and that believers should take comfort in that and, and trust in him. But anyway, long gone, says Tolstoy, are the days where we can say that someone like Napoleon rises up and changes history. No, no. Napoleon himself only ever became the emperor of France because everyone around him enabled it. Napoleon is the result of microscopic causes that nobody could have foreseen or changed. Napoleon isn't even that special. He just is the guy who's along for the ride like the rest of us who finds himself in these positions from little decisions that he and everyone around him has made. 
And all these things happen according to a swarm-like life of human beings. Well, we've talked a lot about Tolstoy's view of freedom and determinism, and I hope that you at least have a flavor for the way that he approaches the conversation. But now I'd like to transition away from the text and more into the ideas in a more abstract way. I want you to be able to walk away from our conversation with an understanding of the categories of free will and how people have debated about it, not only throughout the history of philosophy, but also right now. Because people still debate about free will and determinism. Sam Harris is a uh, neuroscience, uh, excuse me, Sam Harris is a neuroscientist and atheist thinker and, and popular intellectual, and he often debates with Ben Shapiro about ethics, values, religion, that sort of stuff. And free will often comes up. And so I think it's important for you to know the different viewpoints. And then, of course, I'll end with my own viewpoint. As you probably noticed, Tolstoy doesn't attempt to reconcile free will and determinism. All he does is say, look, we are clearly free as human beings to, to do what we want to do moment by moment, minute by minute. But we're also bound by this swarm-like life of human beings where as soon as we make actions and make decisions, we look back and go, I wonder if I actually ever could have done otherwise considering the factors and conditions that really led up to that decision. Other thinkers, of course, are going to disagree with Tolstoy, both from the theist and the atheist viewpoints. Harris, as an atheist, for example, is known for his deterministic views. Most materialists are determinists, by the way, and it makes perfect sense. A materialist is someone who believes that the only things that are real are matter and motion, so no God, no soul, nothing outside the universe. And on this view, free will has to be an illusion. Even consciousness itself has to be an expression of brain states, which are subject to the physical reality that you're not in control of either. So everything that would make you think you have free will is just an illusion. Human beings are biological machines who are programmed to do certain things by our DNA, and we're given stimuli by our environment, and so we just do the next thing that's in front of us. All of our actions are determined by prior and sufficient causes. This is kind of the classical materialist determinist view, and, and this seems very natural and intuitive given our understanding of Newtonian physics. Everything happens for a reason, and those reasons have sufficient and understandable causes. Why would the behavior of human beings be any different? Well, now I'd like to offer the uh, religio-philosophical counter which says, now, wait a minute, human beings are not just moist robots, and you don't get to reject the notion of a, a ghost in the machine so easily. I have a conscious mind I have a conscious mind that exists within my body, and I make choices intentionally, which have consequences. And if you're going to tell me that my life has been determined since the beginning of the universe, and that atoms and molecules in my brain have already determined everything I'm going to do in the future, we have a big problem. I mean, what do we do with the murderer who just killed a pawnbroker and stole her money? After all, he didn't really have a choice in the matter, did he? The choice was determined by his genes and environment, which he can't control. So, sure, he committed a crime, but he isn't really guilty of anything. He just has some brain wiring that's different than yours. And if he didn't have any free will, then he didn't actually do anything wrong. And if he did, it's not even really his fault. Do you see the problem? You can't blame gravity for shattering your new computer, but you can blame your little brother for picking it up and throwing it on the ground. But on determinism, they work the same way. Both gravity and human behavior are just the result of dominoes falling over one after another. Determinism ejects any possibility of moral responsibility. At least, that's the objection. And of course, the second objection is like it. it Determinism doesn't make sense of our everyday conscious experience. This is Tolstoy's point. I can move my arm right now, or I can refrain from moving my arm. And this is something where someone like Jordan Peterson would come in and say, look, you can't live life believing that you're determined. Nobody lives like that. We act as if the world manifests potential, and that it's our responsibility to do the right thing and to turn that potential into good. Or you'll, you'll hear, you will hear someone like Ben Shapiro argue along with Objection 1. 
he'll say something like, you can't build a functional society with the idea that we're all just wound up robots. You have to have a notion of free will to ground personal responsibility. And then, of course, you need personal responsibility to ground morality. And you need personal responsibility and morality to have a stable and healthy nation or society or culture. But aside from the religio-philosophical arguments against determinism, there are interesting atheistic arguments against determinism too. Daniel Dennett is an American philosopher who studied at Oxford and Harvard and is holding out for a deeper understanding of quantum theory before ruling out the idea of free will. Because determinism is based on the idea that physics behaves according to consistent and repeatable laws. But on the quantum level, there seems to be an uncertainty about where a particle exactly is and therefore where it's going. This uncertainty could mean that the future is not determined and therefore perhaps minds and brains like the ones that we have could hypothetically have self-determining power after all. There's another argument against determinism that I think is interesting. I, uh, I think I heard it from Alvin Plantinga. Uh, he's a Christian philosopher from Calvin College. Listen to this. If determinism is true, you can never really know it. That's the claim, anyway. And it, the reason is, is that if, you, if you're listening to the arguments against free will and you believe that determinism is true, then you can only really know that you've been determined to think that determinism is true. And that's the big difference. How do you know that you believe determinism is true because there are good reasons versus believing determinism is true because you've been determined to believe it? And you can't really know. So determinism ends up destroying our ability to know things because, after all, do you know it because it's true or do you think you know it because you've been determined to think so? You'll notice that free will is an area where all bets are off. There are Christian philosophers on both sides of the fence, and there are atheist philosophers on both sides of the fence. So some of the conversations get really interesting really quickly because there are so many different presuppositions and arguments and moving pieces that even if people share conclusions, they'll have different premises. Generally, Christian philosophers are in the libertarian free will camp. And just to remind you, libertarian free will is the view that not only does a person have the ability to choose their future, but that we're not ultimately determined by previous causes or our environment at all, and that we're able to choose freely and have personal responsibility and can be held accountable for choosing the wrong thing. And if we are dominated by our previous influences and, and prior causes, then it eliminates anything close to personal responsibility. Of course, I'm not saying they deny things like influences and, and prior causes, but what I am saying is that they believe ultimately every decision has to come from a free agent. Otherwise, moral responsibility can't be associated with it. And this is going to be really helpful because it'll solve theological conundrums too. Like, why did God allow evil and death to enter the world in Genesis 3? The answer is much more simple for the libertarian free will position. You can just say, well, because God wanted them to have free will. Why does God allow people to go to hell? Well, he doesn't want them to, but he wants to give everyone free will. And so they have a choice of whether they want to follow God and do the right thing and have faith and repent for their sins or not. So the libertarian free will position becomes very co convenient for many Christians because it allows them to make sense of not only the internal cogs of Christianity, but also the external philosophical conundrums that uh, we see in the world. Some Christians, though, do see that human beings are not always in the driver's seat, whether they believe that God controls everything and they really mean it, or whether they accept the naturalistic, atheistic line of reasoning and just conclude that God works through natural, biological means and, and he's pushed the first dominoes and now everything is going from there according to his plan. There are Christians who agree that there's a sophisticated illusion involved with free will. Usually, though, in the philosophical and academic Christian world, the people that are having the debates and writing the books, most of them are Christian libertarians who believe that God has given us free will and therefore we're responsible and, and all the rest. But there is one final view that's in between libertarianism and determinism, and this view is called compatibilism. A compatibilist will look at the ways that human beings are determined by prior causes, by influences, perhaps even by the influence and will of God. And a compatibilist will say, well, 
okay, those things are true and relevant, and, and maybe in some significant sense we are determined, but at the same time, we have to have some definition of free will in order to maintain personal responsibility. And so a compatibilist will say, the deterministic facts of reality are compatible with an idea of legitimate free will and personal responsibility, and maybe even some sense of self-determination. And so what you'll find is that compatibilists are trying to blend what a libertarian and a determinist thinks are not blendable. A libertarian says, look, if you're determined, then you don't have free will. And if you don't have free will, you can't be responsible. Done. End of conversation. And a determinist says, look, if you can't choose your own destiny, if, you, if you're not making decisions for yourself and, and really causing your own future, if everything that happened before is causing everything that happens now, then free will is an illusion and there's no room for anything like free will. But a compatibilist is right in the middle. They come in and say, no, look, yes, maybe we are controlled by forces beyond our control, but that doesn't necessarily mean we're off the hook and that, and that we're just wet robots. Maybe there's a way to combine these things. Thomas Hobbes is a famous English Enlightenment thinker and was a classical compatibilist. Arthur Schopenhauer is a 19th century German atheist philosopher who was also a compatibilist. And he famously said, man can do what he wills, but he cannot will what he wills. And I like that, and I do agree with that. A man can do what he wills, but he cannot will what he wills. In some sense, you're free to do whatever you want, but in another sense, you can only ever do exactly what you want. And this is how a compatibilist is generally going to talk. They're not so concerned with causes and influences. A libertarian will say, well, you have to do what you want and you have to have been able to do otherwise. Meaning, you could have had to have legitimately been able to choose something else. But a compatibilist says, okay, well, maybe prior causes or the will of God or, or whatever else has determined your actions. Maybe the neurons and hormones and the will of God and all these things are, are really the driving force of all of your decisions. But at the end of the day, if you want to do something and you do it, then that's what we can call free will. If you want to do it and you do it, then you are free and you can be held responsible for that. This is something that's often called soft determinism because a compatibilist is going to acknowledge that human beings don't have ultimate power, but we're going to try to work in an idea of personal responsibility and, and free will in the midst of that. Many compatibilists are also going to have a conversation about, well, what does it mean to really be able to do otherwise? We're going to want to talk about what it means to be able to do anything at all, actually. So to use an example from the Bible, Joseph's father uh, gives him a coat of many colors. You've probably heard this story. And his brothers are f jealous and, and angry at the favoritism uh, that Joseph's father is displaying to him. And so the text says that the brothers were unable to breathe a kind word to him. So in my view, when the text says that they're unable to breathe a kind word, I don't think that the text is saying they were literally unable to push air out of their throats and mouths and, and say nice words. I, I think what the text means is, no, no, no. They could physically do it, but they were morally unable. They were so jealous and corrupt and bitter and angry that they were not able to do something that they should have been able to do. And so I don't see the text saying, well, they weren't able to, and so therefore they are, they're not really morally responsible for it. I see the text saying, no, they weren't able to, and that actually makes it worse. And I, I got this from the American theologian Jonathan Edwards, and I think he's absolutely right. The Bible seems to say that we are responsible for our behavior, but also that at the end of the day, God is the one who's always going to fulfill his purposes. Well, both the libertarian and the determinist is not going to have a lot of fun with that idea. They're going to criticize it up and down and left and right, because in some sense, it's, it's a... It's trying to be a blended hybrid of the views. It's trying to acknowledge both the reality of determinism, but also the necessity of free will in order to make sense of the world. And I think Tolstoy is actually a compatibilist also, because as I've explained throughout the whole episode, 
he sees that human beings must essentially be free. However, we're also bound in a significant and mysterious way. And that's all I really wanted to say in this episode. Obviously, there's much more that could be said. Feel free to try and work out some of these ideas on your own. There's a a lot of resources and interesting voices in these conversations that make for great debate. And I'd also love to hear from you in a personal way. I want to set up a system where if you donate a certain amount a month, then then you can give me a call and, and we can have a recorded conversation and maybe I'll string two or three of them and throw out a bonus episode of them. I think that'd be a lot of fun. This would be a great topic of a conversation to have is, is why I'm telling you this now. And the reason for that is because I, I think it, it's very deep. It is. I, I've, I've only scratched the surface. However, I do think I've given you a very wide palette of understanding in, in order to kind of approach the conversation, especially with the distinction of libertarianism, determinism, and then compatibilism right in the middle. So say goodbye to War and Peace. Uh, It's sad that we're going to put it on the shelf, but, you know, all good things have to come to an end, I suppose. So um, thank you for listening, and until next time. Check, 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 check. Turn the gain up. Turn the gain up. Trying to get that right sound volume. Oh, get a big stretch. You're going to be recording today. Look at that. 12.39 p.m. Captain's Log. Episode 4. More in peace. We got a lot to talk about. And will we get to it? Probably. I mean, it'll, t- it'll take a while, you know. We'll, we'll loop around and... You'll be an idiot and you'll have to re-record like 50,000 times. But you know what? It'll happen. It'll happen. (laughs) Listen to this quote when I get around to feeling like reading it. Because right now is not that moment. I'm going to go back and listen to everything and uh, bemoan the fact that I suck at recording. Hey! I'm back. Okay. Did you miss me? Did you miss me? Did you miss me? Did you miss me? That's a Sherlock reference. All right. Time to read the quote. (laughs) Ahem.